Hi, everybody. This next session is by Alejandra Olvera Novak. Uh, and this is how it's the Jetson stage, uh, building robots with a AWS and uh, RoboMaker. So uh, take it away, Alejandra. Thank you, Memo. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. So who's excited to talk about robots? Really? That's it? Who's excited to talk about robots? Woo! Yeah, all right. So uh, can you see my PowerPoint OK? Is that working? Yes? All right. Canela, acuéstate. So this is Canela, my service dog. And I actually decided to include her in the talk, so stay tuned. She'll come in in a second. So if you watched the Jetsons when you were young, you probably marveled at the idea of robots becoming a part of our daily lives. If you're young and maybe you're a millennial, maybe you didn't grow up with the Jetsons. Uh, the Jetsons is a cartoon that came from the 60s and then it was revamped and started up again in the 80s. And it was really cool because it was a cartoon about a family that lived in a utopian future. What do I mean by YouTube in future? Well, to begin with, they had a three-day work week. Can you imagine what you could do if you had a three-day work week? <laughs> That'd be so cool. They also had uh, Rosie, their little maid robot that helped them all throughout the house. And basically, a lot of the daily chores and you know, coming back and forth from the store, going shopping, like they had all these virtual experiences and things that when I go back and I look at these cartoons now, I'm like, wow, it looks like they traveled to you know, 2019 and then went back and made these cartoons. It's amazing. So you know, today, we're not exactly seeing like, you know, robots rolling around everywhere. I don't have a robot here with me, right? My personal assistant. And you know, we haven't maybe necessarily reached the stage where everybody has their own personal Rosie willing around. But there's definitely robots everywhere today. And I'm talking about you know, anywhere from rovers and Mars to, for example, you know, uh, just your little like Roombas that you have in your house. Uh, does anybody here have a Roomba? I'm curious. Yeah, so see, we already have robots in our day-to-day -day life. We just don't always think about it that way. Now, that said, until now, robotics development hasn't really been all that accessible to other people and just people that are, you know, coming from maybe like minorities or like somebody who wasn't able to get a degree. Like there's all these different areas and reasons why it might be hard for somebody to get into robotic development. And so today, as I'm here, you know, talking to you about this guy, about this, I don't really care if you're a VP or a developer or an academic researcher. Uh, my goal, my dream for you to take away from this talk is one, that AWS Rubbermaker is awesome and hopefully you'll love and want to use it later on and see how cool it is. But two, I'm really hoping that you'll be excited to try to uh, accelerate adoption of different things like open source and just helping see how robotics could help make the future better for other day people. All right, so I am a very colorful person and I don't really like boring demos, so I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna talk about who is using AWS RoboMaker. We'll also kind of go briefly into how the cloud is really changing the future of robotic development. We're definitely gonna go over what AWS RoboMaker is. I'll show you a little bit about the development environment, how to spin up your simulation environment. That said, uh, as probably a lot of you already know, uh, the venue in general here has been having issues with internet. So pray to the gods that the internet works so I can actually do my demo for you later on. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about what I just mentioned about whether or not robotics development is accessible for anyone to pick up. What are things that we could be doing to help make it more accessible for anyone to get into this? All right, so first of all, who is someone that is using AWS Rubber Maker? And I want to talk about Leah. So what's Leah? Leah is a robot walker that keeps the elderly safe and active. And using the AWS RoboMaker cloud extensions, they were able to use other Amazon services like Lex and Polly to enhance Leah with voice commands. Now, Leah is very interesting. So she's actually an autonomous robot walker. What does this mean? It means that if you call her, she will come to you. It, you can actually tell Leah, hey, go charge yourself. And it'll go to the room where it's supposed to be charged. Anybody else here thinking of Baymax from Big Hero 6? Remember that huge white robot that could actually go get itself charged? And now we're seeing that in real life. Like this is not just a cartoon thing. Like this is happening. Leah is also very interactive. Uh, she can build a map of your environment, which is your home, and navigate it just like a regular robot would in your home. The handlebars at Leah can actually detect intention when you lean on it, and it'll start moving forward with you. In addition, you can actually dance with it and hold on to it for support and do your exercise, and it has over 70 sensors. That's crazy. A robot walker with over 70 sensors, some of them LiDAR, of course. So why did I pick Liam? 
There's other interesting customer stories, like for example, AWS Rubbermaker actually teamed up with JPL program from NASA, and they, uh, the software that we use to create our simulation environment for Rubbermaker was then used for their open source rover as well. But I didn't pick that one. I, today I wanted to feature Leia, and that's because I think Leia is a really good example of how robots can help the world become more accessible for all kinds of people. Now, some of you may have noticed that I have my service dog with me. This is Canela. So Canela helps me navigate my everyday life. Um, I really, really could not live without her. Now, the thing about Canela is that before she came into my life, it took me a really hard time. It was really hard for me to uh, accept the fact that I needed help, that I needed a service animal. It's very humbling to realize that. And then there was the whole process of where do you even get a service animal? Where do you get it trained? How much money is that going to cost me? There's a lot of investment training that goes into her being this quiet next to me while I'm talking to you. And when I think of robots like Leah, and I see things like Canela, my service animal, I can't help but be excited for the future and how technology can help other people with disabilities. I really, really think that that's something that robotics could do. Obviously, my service dog is amazing. She can do all kinds of things. Uh, she's trained to do things like help with uh, flashbacks, disassociation episodes. She's like freaking amazing. She can also tell if you're like uh, really anxious. She takes care of you for that. If I'm on the road and something is like not making me feel well, she'll kind of like take the lead and keep us going. And she's only a dog, you know? A dog is a very smart, but obviously a dog or a human is not going to be able to have all the capabilities that a robot has. So when I see robots like Leah, I think, hey, you know what? I would love to help future people like me and help make robotics like, better to keep helping other people. So let's talk a little bit about what robotics was like before the clouds, or really just how much the cloud in the game is changing what could happen in the future of the robotics field. Well, first of all, you're going to notice that there's actually some less barriers to entry. And that's because once you start noticing that a lot of your hardware is becoming smaller and faster, that means by default that some of the prices for working with robotics development would drop. In addition, when you're working with things like simulation environments, which we're going to go into in a second with Gazebo and AWS Rubbermaker, you can see how, hey, I don't even need to invest in buying the hardware for uh, my own personal raw spot to play around with work. I could initially first just work with simulations and save my money. And that's really useful for, for example, academic research or schools. Maybe a school doesn't have money to buy 20 different ROSBOTs for their class, but they can spin up a simulation environment and still learn the same thing and still learn about debugging and testing on the simulation environment. So I'm excited to tell you a little bit about how AWS is actually a part of impacting the future of robotics. First of all, we're making it easy to write code in our AWS Rover Maker IDE. And I'm going to show you that in a second and how that works. We're also making it really cheap to run our simulations and our tests. And we're trying really hard to provide out-of-the-box solutions for managing fleets of robots. Isn't it crazy? We're just talking like, you know, we're talking about managing fleets of robots. Can you imagine 10 years ago talking about this? This is crazy. So again, I mentioned to you to consider the premise of how hardware prices could be dropping for robots, that we don't necessarily see an explosion of new robots in our day-to-day -day life. And I think that a lot of that is because writing this software is really hard. It's hard to get started, it's hard to develop, it's hard to test and to deploy, and that's why we really, really need to start working on solutions to make this easier to get into. And we think that AWS Rovermaker software is one of the answers to that solution. Now, Mike Bell, uh, he's currently uh, the VP of I and IoT at Ubuntu, he believes that making the use of the cloud will continue to result in lower costs and faster hardware. And I completely agree with this guy. Now, we talked a little bit about how the cloud is bringing changes to the robotics field. We talked a little bit about why we're excited about robotics. But let's talk a little bit now about AWS Rovermaker and just get to know what it is. So first of all, AWS Rovermaker has a full service suite for you that makes it easy for you to do your know, development and your testing for your robotic applications. We have cloud extensions for ROS, really good support there. We have a development environment that it can, in fact, be installed with a single click and showing you later that in today's demo. We also have simulation environments, which I mentioned are really useful when you yourself may not want to run off and buy your hardware, but you still want to get started and see what it's like. 
And for fleet management, we offer over there deployment with AWS Greengrass. In fact, it's the first installation of fleet management in cloud robotics. ROS, Robot Operating System. Quick question, how many in the audience are familiar with ROS? All right, cool. I never like to give a talk and assume that anybody knows anything. I like to all, you know, not have any preconceptions. So I'm just going to make sure that we go through it and everybody knows what ROS is and how amazing it is. But first, I need to tell you a short little story. So a little over 10 years ago, a group of students at Stanford University were doing research on robotics for their PhDs. They made the observation that even themselves as researchers, they were constantly blocked in their research. Why is that? Why were they being constantly slowed down all their time? It was because they had to build everything from the ground up. So then they started asking themselves some questions. And they're like, OK, you know, what if we could write software to get started from up and running? What if I could eliminate that and not have to do that manually myself? What if we were to contribute this to open source so that people behind us can also benefit from what we're doing and building today. And this actually led to something that is now called Willow Garage. It basically is a group of people that for years had now been contributing to writing open source software for robotics. And we call this ROS. Now, ROS stands for Robot Operating System, but it's actually kind of funny because ROS is not an OS at all. It's only actually middleware that runs on top of an operating system. OK, so we know what ROS is not, but what is ROS? Well, first of all, it's a publish and subscription framework. It's completely open source. Academia researchers love it. It is the largest ecosystem of packages and tools. It has the largest developer community from you know, the robotic development community. It has immense industrial support, not just here at AWS, but also other amazing companies like Microsoft, Botch, Toyota Research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, there's actually a ROS2. And AWS is very active in trying to accelerate the adoption of ROS2. Why are we so excited about ROS2 over ROS1? Well, first, let's try to understand what's the same in ROS1 and ROS2. Nodes, messages, publishers, subscribers, that's all the same. We still have the same command line and graphical tools. So what's new? Well, first of all, we have middleware interface now, and it's based on DDS. Also, we have data security. I know this is going to sound crazy, but in ROS1, there was no actual solution or features for security. <laughs> How many times have we not seen that things like accessibility and security are treated as add-on features instead of something that you need to add from the get-go? So AWS is, has a, the team of developers under the AWS Rubermaker org, and they themselves have been actively contributing, specifically a lot of work to the data security features that are now available in ROS2. And we're really excited about all their amazing work. And I wanted to make sure to give them a call out for that. So what can you do with ROS? You know, um, I know some of you mentioned you're already familiar with it. Well, first of all, you can find packages. Uh, it'll be very similar to like, I don't know, our interview, Python, or JavaScript developers, for example. So you're probably familiar with packaging ecosystems, right? If you work with Python, you've used pip, maybe. If you work with Node.js, you've probably worked with NPM, right? So ROS is kind of the same thing. You can find packages for sensors, kind of like depth camera and LiDAR. You can also have packages for full algorithms that'll do things like navigation, slam so robots know where they are in their environment. You also have, as I mentioned before, simulation. And you can do some really cool simulations in both 2D and 3D. And as you can see, they're really fun to make. There's a lot of awesome debugging tools and logging and testing. Honestly, ROS is an incredibly rich ecosystem. And we think at AWS that in terms of robotics, ROS could be the equivalent of Linux for robotics. I notice here that I'm running a little battery, so I'm actually going to have to check this out. All right. All right, let's talk a little bit about gazebo simulations. So if you're working with AWS RoboMaker, you will be working with ROS as your main packaging system. But then you're also going to want to know what you're going to be using for your simulations. So we use Gazebo. Gazebo is actually maintained by the same foundation that maintains ROS. And I'm going to show you this quick little video. So you can see here that I have a sample Gazebo world library. And this specific world library is of a racetrack. 
The little robot model that you see moving around there is a Husserian Rosbot version 2.0. And in this case, it's using reinforcement learning to travel around the track and not you know, get out and crash. That's one of the simulation worlds you can see in Gazebo. Uh, there's other cool ones, like there's actually a world where it's like Mars, and you can pretend to be driving around a little robot there. There's apartments and all kinds of things. And we'll actually see another world in just a second in the demo. Fingers crossed the internet works. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the development environment. What does it feel like to use a AWS Rover Maker ID? Well, first of all, you don't need a setup an Ubuntu development environment. You can spin up AWS Rover Maker in a few single clicks. Now, this is crazy. As you know, uh, for any developers in the audience, who's my developers? Where are my developers? Hey, guys. Ladies, how are you? You know that setting up your development environment is usually one of the first huge pains in your petunias that you got to deal with, right? Well, the cool thing about the Rovermaker IDE is that the folks here at AWS actually made a point of flying over and working with the folks in Cloud9, which is the IDE that we're going to be using, and they enhanced it to include a full robotic development environment. So you don't need to set up Ubuntu if you don't want to. And that's one of the reasons why I think that AWS Rovermaker is a software that is really approachable to beginners. Because as you know, as a beginner, when you first get started out, the initial troubleshooting can be really scary, and it could drive other people away from it. But if you know that, hey, AWS actually created a Rovermaker IDE that all you need to do is just click, spin it up, that doesn't sound scary. I can do that, right? And so I think that's really cool. Now, uh, number two, I know this sounds really crazy, but it really is simple. You can just set up your environment with a single click of a button, and we'll see that in a moment. Now, it can, the IDE will actually automatically download, build, and bundle. And you can do all of those with just a few clicks as well. I mean, you obviously have the option of your terminal and doing it there. But you can actually build and bundle both your robot and your simulation application in a single click. That's crazy. We'll see that in a moment. And it is integrated with Cloud Extensions for ROS, as I mentioned a moment ago. And I want you to kind of like get a feel for this. So as you look at this diagram, you're going to notice that a few things are missing that you might have seen at AW other AWS presentations when you see these diagrams. First of all, there's no server up there at all. And there's no EC2 instance listed for you to provision and to manage. That's because AWS Rovermaker manages all the infrastructure for MU from behind the scenes. So let's go a little bit through this diagram and kind of like understand it a little bit. So in the middle, in the build section, you're going to see a reference to the AWS Cloud uh, 9. And in there, you see that it shows you that once you open up your IDE, you're going to start off with a simulation workspace as well as a robot workspace. And then, of course, using ROS packaging ecosystem and several cloud extensions for ROS that are available for you. Then moving on over to the bundle section, you would basically build and bundle your simulation application as well as your robot application. And then you upload those to an S3 bucket. And then, of course, at the end, you're able to spin up your environment, the simulation environment. So we've been talking a lot about the simulation environment. Let's get a better feeling for what it's like. What is it? Well, first of all, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the ability to do uh, use packaging systems for both 2D and 3D worlds. So we have pre-built 3D simulation worlds. Or if you wanted to, like I mentioned, Gazebo has a whole bunch of other libraries for different kinds of worlds, and they're all fun to use. So you can go in and you know, bring in and integrate your own Gazebo world library that you want to use. As I mentioned in the previous slide, as well with simulation as with the development IDE, you have zero infrastructure to provision or to configure or to manage. That's a huge load off your shoulders. You can also run multiple simulations in parallel. And out of scaling can be best on your simulation complexity. So let's go ahead and get a better understanding of what it's like to work with all these different simulation tools. There's a few there we'd want to get familiar with. Uh, first of all, you're going to notice the Gazebo client at the very top in the left, followed by RQT and Artviz, and then, of course, a uh, terminal that you can spin up as well. So let's start with Gazebo. What is Gazebo client? What can I do with it? Gazebo is a 3D simulation, a dynamic simulator that can simulate populations of robots in both complex outdoor and indoor environments. 
gazebo is the one that we're going to use in a moment to spin up our world. In this case, it's going to be an apartment, and we should be able to see the robot moving through the world. Now, RQT, next in line, is the software framework of ROS that implements various GUI tools in the form of plugins. I mentioned before I don't like to assume what my audience does and does not know. So uh, GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. RQ2 allows you to quickly filter messages, and you can filter them based on what node is publishing them. And this is really useful for troubleshooting and debugging, because as you know, logs provides a lot of information when you need to debug our code. You can also use RQT to kind of build a quick and dirty um, control panel or a status window for your robot. And so you can kind of control the velocity. You can check out and filter which messages from the nodes that are being published you want to read and check out. And we'll see that in a moment. And RVIS, which stands for ROS Visualizer, is a 3D visualizer for displaying sensor data and state information from ROS. The cool thing about RViz is that you can do all, all kinds of similar simulations. In fact, you can spin up uh, gazebo simulations inside of it, too. You can open up the uh, camera add-on, and then you can actually see the view of what the robot is seeing. It's because remember, a robot will see the world very different from the way that you and I see the world. First of all, consider your height, right? Well, I'm not too tall, but you know, I'm up here, right? The robot is down here below, for example, like a sample turtle bot, which we'll see in a moment. And they're usually about this thick. You know, so when it's scanning its environment, it can scan all around, but it can't necessarily see as high up as you can, right? So there's all these different things and issues that developers have to deal with and take into account when they're doing their robotic development. They have to think about, where am I going to put my sensors? Where am I going to put my camera? Canela, acuéstate. I have to worry about where I'm going to put my dog. You know, there's all these things you've got to worry about. All right, so if you want to dive deeper and really get it into uh, understanding how to use all these tools, uh, just go ahead and go straight to the source. So as I mentioned earlier, Gazebo is maintained by the same foundation that maintains ROS. So all of this related uh, documentation about how to use Gazebo and RVIS and RQT would be at wiki.ros.org. And I'll just give you a second in case anybody wants to take a picture or anything to check that out later. Now, finally, the question we've all been waiting for. What are other AWS services that I can pair with AWS Rover Maker? Well, as I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of cloud extensions that are compatible with ROS. So right now, if you wanted to, you could integrate things like Amazon Lex. Lex is for dialogue management. It allows you to build bots similar to an Alexa skill, and then you can build a custom-based text robot. Now, you can use Polly as well. Polly is text to speak. So it'll take any string and convert it into an audio file in the language of your choice. Next, you have Amazon Kinesis Video Stream. So as I mentioned, the robot will have different sensors, and you can add all kinds of different cameras or deep lens to your turtle bot or whatever ROS bot of your choice that you're working with. So you could cook up the camera with the Kinesis video stream. You also have Amazon recognition. So what you could do with that one, for example, with your ROS bot is I could set it there in the floor, and I could configure it to recognize whether or not I'm a puppy. So for example, it's spinning on the floor. It sees Canela, and it'll identify it as a puppy. If it sees me, it'll say, no, you are not a puppy. So things like that. And then, of course, Amazon CloudWatch for all the logging and monitoring that you would need. Now, the example that I gave you a second ago about the puppy, we actually did build that as a demo once <laughs> for another conference. And I wish I could have brought that in, because that was a lot of fun. We had a little stuffed dog that we had on the table. And so we had all these customers coming up and saying, why do you have a stuffed dog on the AWS table? What are you doing? Ah, OK, so yeah. <laughs> But here's the real question and the one that I'm really excited to talk about. So I mentioned to you before, I'm really passionate about things that'll help, that'll use technology to help improve the world for people that have other specific needs, you know, disabilities or whatever your problem is that you need extra support in. And if we want other people to be able to have access to these tools, we need to make sure that these tools are accessible and easy to use. Why has it felt for so long that it hasn't been that way? Well, for one, the truth is that robotics is hard. It requires machine learning expertise. 
not everyone can just pick up machine learning. I mean, think about people who come from minority or diverse backgrounds. Do you think they can just like that get into machine learning? No, probably not, right? There's also so many prototyping iterations. Has anybody worked with prototypes here before? It could be any kind of prototype. doesn't have to be a robotic one. Yeah, were those done in like three to five minutes? Did anybody finish their prototype in three to five minutes? Raise your hand. Yeah, I didn't think so. No hands raised. Yeah, prototyping takes so many iterations. That's a lot of work. Not to mention you can take up days to set up and configuring everything you need. So as a developer, for example, I, again, I'm assuming there's more developers in the audience. Whenever you set up your development environment, we mentioned that that can take a lot of work. If you're lucky, you can get it done in a couple of hours. It could take you a couple of days. You never know. And lastly, it honestly takes months to build a realistic simulation environment. I have uh, found out that some customers have told us that it usually takes them about two to three months to do several iterations of this. It's crazy. Like This is like hogging a lot of developer time. So do you remember that earlier we mentioned the premise that if hardware prices are dropping for robots, you know, we should see an explosion of robots everywhere in our day-to-day -day life. But they're not here in this room. Where are these robots, right? Well, I mentioned that you know, it's hard to get into robotics. It's hard to get writing the software. And we're really hoping that tools and software like AWS RoboMaker and the RoboMaker IDE can help make things easier. We're really trying to lower the bar to entry. So at this point, We'd finally want to get into the demo. That said, the internet has been lagging, so let's see how that goes. You're going to have to bear with me. Sorry about that. Earlier, I tried using the hotspot. That didn't work. Then they mentioned, hey, maybe a, you know Ethernet cord could do the job. We'll see. Meanwhile, though, I do want to mention that I asked the RoboMaker team, hey, you know, I'm going over to the Collision Conference, and how can I let them reach back out to you? Is there a good email for you for them to contact you if you, they have any ideas or any questions in the audience? Um, if I make this. Let me go ahead and make this into presentation mode again. So if you want to shoot us out your ideas or your questions, go ahead and email us at aws-robomaker-interest at amazon.com. And we're really excited to tell you anything you need. I see people are still out with cameras, so I'll give it a second. <laughs> Maybe the internet will start working in a moment. <laughs> no. Okay, I think it's working. Thank you. <laughs> my saviors, just give him a hand. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Canela. <laughs> okay, she can stay with Memo. She likes Memo a lot. <laughs> See, I told you this would be an interesting presentation, that she would have a part in the play. That was the part right there. Okay. Now, if I can just figure out how to start this. OK. Um, first of all, I want to make sure I'm, the same, I'm in the right region. Basically, I've been fiddling around for, uh, I'm giving this similar talk at three other conferences. And so I've been doing a slightly variation of the different demo. And so I have different things in different regions. And now I have to remember in which region I have this demo. Bear with me. So sorry. <laughs> It's a good thing I'm not giving a talk about the internet. That would be very sad. Woo! All right. Now I can show you what I wanted to show you. Okay. 
All right. So first of all, when you log in to your AWS Management Console, um, just to get you started, you know, you would just go here and click, you know, AWS RoboMaker. Now, in this case, you notice that it's a recently visited service. So I was able to just go into it directly. When you open it up, you're going to see to your left a uh, panel navigation with the different things that you're going to work with. So let's think about this as you would as a regular developer moving through all of this. So as a developer, you probably have you know, your workflow of you, know, you write your code, you build, you bundle it, you do your testing, then you have to deploy. Now in this case, it's a little bit different because we're actually talking about robots here. So when you're deploying your code, you're actually deploying it to the physical robot. And then, as I mentioned before, we also have fleet management. So you would basically create a robot, and you would click a name. This architecture is fine. You would create an AWS Greengrass group. And if you wanted to, you could add a key and value pair system. And then, I'm not going to do this now for the purpose of the demo. I'm just walking you through understanding how it works. And then you would register your robot. And in the, oh, thank you. I have 7%. <laughs> <coughs> so we're going to fly through the demo. And then in your fleet, you would actually go through and register your robot. So then basically, if you want to deploy to a fleet of robots for every single robot you've created, you then register it, which that then adds it to your fleet. And so then from then on, when you're making a deployment, it deploys your code to all of the robots in your fleet. Now, that said, there are a few safeguards in place. So let me go ahead to, I think, deployments. And when you create a deployment, you're going to notice at the bottom, there's some extra settings that you could use to determine what percentage of your robots you want to be working uh, before the deployment to continue. So maybe you want only 20% of, uh, you, want, uh, you request at least 20% of your robots on your fleet to be successfully uh, you know, using the code, and then it can continue the deployment. But if it detects that less than 20% of the robots in your fleet are you know, processing the deployment just fine, then it'll cancel and stop. You can also add a failure threshold percentage. Uh, as you meant, in this case, it's set for 25%. As far as your regular work, I'm going to show you two things. So I want to show you how to spin up your development environment and how to spin up your simulation application, because those are the most relevant to what we're talking about today. So in this case, I already had a few sample environments created. If you wanted to create one, you just click Create Environment. And remember that I mentioned to you that when you set up a RoboMaker ID, there's just a few clicks to get it configured, and then just one click to spin it up. So you, know, you would choose your name. You choose your instance type. In this case, you know, M.4 is fine your IM role, VPC, and then you create it. But again, I mentioned I already have one, so I'm not going to create a new one and, because uh, that'll kind of waste time for the purpose of the demo. So this is one that was already there. And I'm spinning up now the RiverMaker IDE. And in a second, you're going to see Cloud9. While we're doing that, let me go ahead and also show you uh, one of the sample simulation jobs I mentioned to you all these cool simulation tools like Gazebo or Viz. Let's take a look at what those actually look like. So in this case, you see that my simulation is already running, and all my tools are ready to use. So I am going to show you a few things here. So for example, if I spin up Gazebo, the main simulation one, we should be able to see our little Razabot moving around in a apartment eventually, when the internet kicks in. <laughs> and then, hmm. we also have a few other things here. So this is where you would be able to access the other tools that I mentioned, like RQT, RViz. Uh, you can also spin up a terminal here. Uh, I was hoping to show you and spin up both Gazebo, and then I wanted to spin up our Viz so that I could show you the different configurations that you could do with these tools to kind of uh, modify 
the camera and the different sensors and maybe add laser. I want to actually show you how to add lasers to this presentation. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that with the current internet problems. <laughs> I'm going to little go a little bit off script here and maybe do some Googling so at least you can see what it looks like. Assuming that works as well. OK. So this is an example of you would, what you would see if I were able to actually spin this up. This is an example of one of the worlds. Uh, I think this is similar to what we were looking at earlier that was like a little racetrack. There are also uh, this one right here, for example. So this is what it would look like if we were able to spin up the RViz tool. So the RViz will open up, and it basically shows you this blank grid, kind of like what you're seeing here. And then you can configure and add your robot model, and then you can add the sensors. And so in this case, you see that it's uh, that little orange thing is the sensor of the robot as it's going through its environment. I think I will also show you where the AWS documentation is for this. So if you go, you can just go to, uh, you know, aws.amazon.com slash robotmaker. And here you should be able to see access to the other applications that are ready to spin up. So ideally, in your home, you will actually have good internet, and you'll actually be able to spin this up. And if you wanted to spin up some of these sample applications, we already have some that are already pre-built and ready for you to go. So you don't even need to worry about writing the code. Like, all the code is there in the GitHub. And we have apps for building a basic Hello World app application just to get you started. So that one will basically, uh, your robot can rotate in place from a forward and backward. Then we also have written applications for the other cloud uh, services that I was mentioning. Because I mentioned that you can hook up Rovermaker to other services. So for example, there's an app there ready for um, Kinesis streaming. And so you hook it up, and then you can actually you know, start uh, recording what your robot is watching. So. I feel so sad that I was not able to show you my demo. The internet is just not working here. So I know that when it comes to time, it's 9.44, and it was more or less when we were hoping to wrap up. So um, I don't know. We should open it maybe for uh, any questions from Twitch or anything like that. Or does anybody have any questions? Does that mean the robot would need to maintain an internet connection as well while this is running, like if you're talking to it? Yes, you need an internet connection. And from Twitch, we had a question uh, from Evil with a Smile that was, uh, what are the most common uh, programming languages for the development environment? Oh, yes. So usually the two top ones that robotic developers like to use are C++ or Python. Although you can also use Java and JavaScript and a few other ones, but those are usually the popular ones. Um, you had a question? So when you design a robot, um, can you get like a, a build? Like if you want to, if you get a robot, it works the way you want it, and you want to actually build it. Does um, does this platform allow you to find the right hardware to buy? Uh, does the platform allow me to what? To find the right hardware to buy. Oh, yes, that we get that question often. So at AWS, we don't have a section to buy the hardware. But uh, since you brought up the hardware, which is a very good question, uh, basically, I would just recommend something like um, Rosbot. There are different kinds of Rosbots. This is a, oh, 
Well, that's not it. <laughs> Wrong. Goodness, okay. I, I think I'll show you the Husserian one. Husserian. Here we go. So this is very popular among academics. As In fact, actually, this is the one that I've been using back at my lab in Seattle, which is where I'm from. So the Husserian is actually uh, really cool because Husserian has been working with AWS, and they've actually created new uh, learning materials for students, both in high schools and universities. And the nice thing about the Husserian Rosbot is that it's very easy to configure and set up. And there's integrated in their website, once it loads, uh, specifically a tutorial for AWS RoboMaker. So to your question of, hey, what hardware should I buy? Where do I get started? Where to go and buy this? Um, one that I would recommend is the Husserian one because, first of all, the documentation is there to get you started with AWS RoboMaker. Um, I don't know why the internet is so slow, but um, it's basically, uh, you just Google it, and then in their website, which is husserian.com, right there you can actually go and buy the, the hardware. Uh, if you go to, uh, as I mentioned to you, there's a weekend documentation for ROS, the echo packaging system, uh, which I think was like ROS.org. From there, you can also buy other hardware components. So, I mean, you could use things like, uh, they're basically called TurtleBot. So, if you just Google, see, no internet. <laughs> if you just Googled, um, uh, you know, Husserian or ROSBot, uh, Turtle, ROSBot, Hamburger, ROSBot, uh, you can find those at Ross and just buy it from there. And it usually costs around $1,000 or so to get one of them. And uh, some places you have the option of either buying it with all the pieces so that then you can grab it and set it up together yourself. If you're that kind of person that you're like, hey, no, I want to put it together myself. That's part of the fun. Or if you're like, no, I don't want to deal with that headache. I just want to get it ready to go. Then they also sell like the pre-made package already set up and ready to go. So up to you. Uh, with drones? That's, that's a good question. Um, I haven't actually asked the team if they're doing anything with drones. I don't think they are. I think right now they're just using uh, ROS-based turtle bots and Husserian. But if you wanted to make super sure, I would email them at the AWS slash uh, maker slash interests. Um, any more amazing questions due to the lack of internet? <laughs> no? OK. All right, well, thank you so much for your patience about the internet, but I hope you still enjoyed the first part of the talk. At least the slides were cool to look at. And I just hope that our takeaway from this is, hey, uh, I didn't know about it. It was RoboMaker. I didn't know it was so easy to spin up. I want to check it out and get into it. And hopefully we can all get excited together about thinking, hey, how can we do our little part in helping make the future more accessible for tomorrow? So thank you.